Hi, and welcome back to lecture two of teaching learning disabled, or excuse me, children with learning disabilities in the Christian school. We're going to be going over a biblical perspective of special education today and going through several principles, biblical principles, and the idea is not just to convince you of the need to do this, but to empower you to speak to this in the future as a teacher, maybe to your administration, to parents, and particularly to you, um, particularly uh, to a, other teachers who may not um, who may not exactly understand special education and why it's necessary in the Christian school. So hopefully this will give you some tools that you can use. So let's go ahead and I'll share my screen here so you can see my PowerPoint and you can be filling in notes as you go. But I want to go ahead and give credit to Dr. John Vaughn. He was the pastor of a church in uh, Taylor, South Carolina for many, many years. And he is responsible for having started Hidden Treasure Christian School in Taylor, South Carolina. And the reason that he did that is for, well, basically it's for his daughter. He wanted to start a Christian school anyway in their church. But many years ago, many, many years ago at this point, there was an awful house fire um, in his own home. And his daughter was just a baby in a crib at the time. And his wife, I don't know the entire story, I'm going by memory, but I know that his wife ran back into the home to save their baby. And she was able to do that, but the baby was hurt. The daughter was hurt. She was left disabled as a result. Um, and even the mom has suffered severe burns to her hands as a result of this. And But their, their daughter, and I can't remember her name, but their daughter um, did suffer from, from physical and cognitive disabilities as a result of that accident. And then Dr. Vaughn realized that there was nowhere he could send his daughter. He wasn't going to send his daughter to the public school, even though they had, you know, uh, resources for her. He didn't want to do that. He wanted her to have the benefit of a Christian education. So since he couldn't find anywhere, he started one in his own church. And it's named um, Hidden Treasure Christian School. It's still there today. One of our instructors, Dr. John McCormick, uh, was the headmaster there, or the administrator there for, for many years and, and led it just admirably. So I want to give credit to Dr. Vaughn because he is the one who, who came up with what we're going to be going over in these 16 principles um, for special education. But first of all, um, let's talk about this verse right here. This is one of my favorites, Psalm 139, 14, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made Marvelous are thy works. I believe so much in this verse. I had it painted on the walls of my classroom. There's so many other verses that, that you know, are appropriate to the need for special education and God's heart for the weak and the, and those that, and the poor. But this particular verse I felt was just so applicable to what we did in our classroom that we had it painted on the wall. And it looks pretty great. All right, so when you look at your notes, you see here that um, we start out with our mission, and that is to reach all students in Christian schools, not just students who are the academically and the intellectually elite, but also those students who have disabilities, all of them, all Christian families, who, especially those who are in your churches and those who desire a Christian education, they should have access to one whether it's through their own home school or through your Christian school. And for too many years, um, children with disabilities have been left out of Christian education, and that's unfortunate. And um, hopefully this course will help to empower you to be able to meet the needs of more of the children, of parents that are in your church perhaps, or in your community, who really truly want that Christian education for their kids. So the parents and the children, or in the church, sorry, should be committed to developing the spiritual and the, and the academic growth of all students, regardless of physical or academic challenges. And let's go through some of the verses. There's a lot of verses you can put in your arsenal for why we should do this, but Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, open thy mouth for the dumb and, and in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. And I had someone that 
that pointed this out to me one time because he was more of an expert on the Bible and the wording than I am. And he said that, you know, the verse, the words poor and needy do not necessarily just indicate um, economic need or financial needs, but can also be mentally poor and weak, um, intellectually poor and weak, uh, physically poor and weak. So this verse can be applied across the board, not to just those who are poor, but to those who also have, have academic needs. Psalm 41, 1, blessed is he that considereth the poor, the Lord will remember him in the time of trouble. Psalm 82, 3, defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Psalm 12, 5, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Proverbs 19, 17. He that hath pity on the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. So this is not just me saying this. This is not just Mrs. Joyner saying that all Christian schools should be involved in, in helping all children who desire a Christian education. I think that the roadmap is laid for us in scripture um, that this is this is biblical. Special education in the Christian school is a biblical um, a biblical application. All right, let's talk about the principles. Uh, these are the ones that come specifically from Dr. Vaughn that he wrote. And so let's talk about them. Principle number one, a student's disability is God allowed and therefore God given. And, and again, we go back to that verse here that Psalm 139, 14, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But we do live, you know, in a sin-cursed earth. And disability, you know, and some people would say, I don't know, there's just, it didn't used to be that autism and ADHD were um, the diagnosis frequently as they are. I think it doesn't really exist. But I would say, I think that actually we're also seeing more cancer. And we're seeing more heart disease. So I, I think it's wrong to assume that because um, it's being diagnosed more frequently, that it's being diagnosed incorrectly. I think the truth is there's more of it. There's, and when you consider that with the farther and farther we get away from creation and the degeneration of creation, we're going to see more death, more destruction, more disease, and more disabilities. So it shouldn't be shocking. Principle two, a student's disability is not necessarily the result of God's judgment or personal sin. This uh, passage in John 9, 1 through 9, is about the blind man. And then he was questioned, you know, Jesus, when he healed him, he was questioned by the Pharisees, who assumed that he was blind from birth because of a sin that his parents must have done. And Jesus really set him straight. And that's not necessarily the case. So just because a child has a disability does not mean that their parents are being punished. Um, I've done some a lot of research on autism, and autism is, was blamed for many, many years. It was blamed on the mother that if a child was autistic and had autistic behaviors, then the mother was cold and unfeeling towards that child. So grossly unfair to make that generalization and assumption about a mother who was just trying to do the best she could for her child. Principle three is that students with disabilities have a sin nature and they will sin. Trust me, I know that's true, okay? Just because, you know, some of those children, especially the ones with Down syndrome, they look so precious and they are precious in the sight of God, that they are wicked, wicked sinners, just like the non-disabled children are. They will sin and therefore, they do need to be. They do need to be punished, and they need to be disciplined. They need to be. They need. It needs. To, and that, the way I put it is that their disability sometimes is a reason for their bad behavior, but it's not an excuse. So bad behavior out of any child needs to be corrected. <clears throat> it might need to be corrected with a bit more patience in a child with disabilities, but it still needs to be corrected, and it may take longer and more time in order to, to reach that child until it, and fight, <clears throat> excuse me, until finally it sinks in. Principle four, the truth is of God and is available to all learners, including those with disabilities. <clears throat> so this should not be excluded. 
And I think this applies not only to the Christian school, but to our churches. And children who have autism, Down syndrome, ADHD, and so on, sometimes they may be a little bit more difficult to manage in a church setting. That does not mean that they should not. I'm looking for my notes here to see where I put this. I'll, I'll talk about that later. But uh, we should work to include these children in our, in our Sunday schools as well. Principle five is that students with disabilities receive salvation and develop a growing relationship with God. It's so important that we not overlook these kids with disabilities, but realize they also have a soul and they have a need for a savior. And um, I think sometimes they are more open to accepting Christ because they do come with the faith of a little child. But we have to, we have to assume that they can understand even students who are nonverbal, and, and I have a very good friend whose daughter has a, a syndrome that um, is extremely disabling to her, and cognitively and verbally, um, or at least we assume cognitively because she's not verbal. So basically, I, I made an incorrect assumption because I don't know that she is impaired cognitively because she's not verbal, and so and she's not able to write, and so she can't express but we don't know how much she's able to understand. There's a difference between expressive, um, expressive understanding and receptive. So uh, receptive is understanding what we hear and expressive, expressive is what we can um, say. So her mom, I think is wonderful because even at Christmas, she does not talk um, around her daughter about her Christmas gifts and what they're going to get her because she assumes that Rebecca can understand what she's saying. And it's the same way when it comes to training our children um, about God. We need to assume that they do understand and include them in those conversations. Principle six is that students with disabilities learn truth and gain spiritual understanding. I've worked with, oh my goodness, so many students over the past many, many years. And, um, and I know that this is true, it's really great to see kids with disabilities use their gifts to serve the Lord. And their gifts may be clean, you know, or around the church. And I know of someone from our uh, former church who his, he, he was disabled growing up physically and cognitively. And our church hired him to be um, a maintenance work, not maintenance, but janitorial work. And for the past, oh my goodness, I don't know how many years, it's probably 30 years or more, he has worked there and taken his, his responsibilities so seriously and kept the house of the Lord completely and perfectly clean. <laughs> um, and if somebody else messes it up, he is sure to get on to them and remind them, this is God's house and we take care of it. But he takes it on as, as his responsibility and his service for the Lord. Principle seven is that students with disabilities acquire godly character and demonstrate it to others. But again, just like their non-disabled peers, we have to assume that God has a purpose for them just as, as he does the non-disabled. <clears throat> Principle eight is similar to some of the others, but with a slight difference. And that is that students with disabilities are called of God to serve him in some way. We believe that God has a purpose for all of us. And when we accept Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit resides in all of us. And he equips us with spiritual gifts. And that includes children with disabilities. So we need to, as teachers, whether it's your Sunday school teachers or as the classroom teachers, we need to do the best we can to equip those students so that they can use those gifts that they have to serve the Lord. Principle nine is that students with disabilities have everything they need to do God's will for their lives. Yes, we have, this one is powerful to me because this one is the one that helps me realize God didn't make any mistakes. And he knew when that child was being formed in the womb what their weaknesses would be and what their, um, what their disabilities would be and what would get in their way. And yet he has a will for them. And he has made sure that that child is equipped with everything that they need, just like us. So when God has a job for us to do, he equips us to do it. Principle 10 
All callings of callings of God are sacred for all learners, including those with disabilities. So their calling, whether it's to, you know, to sing, and I have had several students who use and that were disabled and yet they have the most beautiful voice and one with pitch, perfect pitch. Um, but their callings are just as sacred as the callings of, of some, you know, other child who has all the gifts and all the abilities. Oops. Principle 11 is that learners, or excuse me, teachers of students with disabilities directly teach, model, and reinforce, um, the, reinforce the truth for them, just like you do all other students. 12 is that teachers of students with disabilities use different, more intensive methods to teach knowledge and, and convey truth. If you've spent any time teaching children with disabilities, you know this is true. That the, the regular, the same old tools in your toolbox that might have worked for a classroom of non-disabled students won't necessarily work for the children who have disabilities. So it does require more from you. It requires more research, which is what you're doing right now, and equipping yourself. It does require more work and more willingness to be flexible and more willingness to be patient and to find new ways and be on a mission to figure it out. And for instance, if you have a, in your classroom, if you have a student who um, comes into your room and they, with, with autism, you need to become an expert on autism. If you have a student in your classroom with cerebral palsy, you need to become an expert on cerebral palsy so that you know how to reach them and how to convey truth to them. Principle 13, the teachers of students with disabilities teach others to understand and accept those disabilities. Many times you will have you will have to directly instruct the other students on how to behave around a student with learning disabilities or with other cognitive disabilities or physical disabilities. But it's your job as the teacher to model for those students how to act and how to understand them and how to be helpful for them. Um, the, but once that lesson is learned, that is powerful. Now, the school where I taught for several years and started a special education program, we saw this. And it was so just fulfilling to see how our non-disabled students really grew in, the, in their compassion and their understanding and acceptance of students who were not exactly like them. And we would see them in the hallway helping them out without even being asked, helping out, opening lockers, showing them to the right classrooms, helping them settle when they would have a meltdown, and maybe protecting them from somebody who was giving them a hard time. But we found that over time, you know, at the beginning, we, we did some direct instruction and we explained what we were doing and that we were bringing, and that we were gonna have some students in our school who did have some disabilities. And we you know, talked to them specifically about how we expected them to behave and, and, and to react. But then over time, we didn't have to do that anymore because we found that just by modeling that behavior and by modeling the extra help that we gave to, to those students, then other students did that. And then it just became very natural, a natural way. And I know our daughter um, and son, both of them grew up in this Christian school and, and they both made the observation to us one time and said, you know, I know that our school is different from other Christian schools, she says, um, but she said, so I think that when other schools come to our school, she said, they, they don't seem to get it like we do. She said, but it's been very stretching and, and allowed us to, to be around a variety of people who aren't just like us. And that is true because honestly, the odds are that many of your, of the, the students in your student body right now, one day when they are older and they have children, many of them are gonna have children who have disabilities. That's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. And so they might as well go ahead and start learning now, um, compassion and understanding. Principle 14, instruction for students with disabilities begins with and is directed by parents in the home. Many of them do homeschool for years and I've had some students um, who came from homes where their parents homeschooled them because they didn't want to put their child with special needs in public school, understandably. 
and they weren't able to find any other options. So they took on that responsibility because it is their responsibility. It is first and foremost the parent's responsibility to educate their children, whether they have disabilities or not. Um, but it's our job to come alongside them and assist these parents and to help them. Principle 15 is that students with disabilities receive extended spiritual instruction in the local church, just like your children with non-disabled students should. Let me tell you what happened one time to illustrate this, the way it should be anyway, but we had in our church, we do have, um, we have things in place for students or children of families in our church who have special needs. It's called the REACH, uh, REACH Each Child. And I know of many other churches also who have really great programs for um, young people who have disabilities, whether it's just through a, like ours was, we didn't have a separate class, like I know some, some churches do. Instead, I just worked on getting a team of helpers, and they would be um, just buddies so who would go in to the class along with a child that might need a little extra assistance. But then that child was able to stay on in the uh, class with his grade level peers, but with the assistance of another, you know, older, either an older teenager or an adult. So one day I got a phone call <clears throat> from a, a pastor or I don't know, it's a ministry leader of another church in our area. Um, and they had heard that we had, you know, special education in our school. And they also had understood that we also did have a program in our church for children with special needs. So he called me and I was curious because he, he was questioning about it and then he got to the heart of it. Here was the deal. He had, uh, there was a family who had a child with special needs, I believe it was autism, and they'd been visiting their church. And so this pastor was looking for another place to send that family because he didn't want to deal with that. And when I figured it out, I was, and I told him, I said, yes, we could, yes, we would be happy to, we would be happy to have this family in our church. We'd be happy to meet the needs of their child. I said, but that's what you should be doing. I said, just the fact that you don't have a, you know, a program or you don't even need a program, but the fact that you don't think you have the facilities to handle them, that's not a good enough reason to tell this family to go to another church. You should figure it out. You should come up with a way to help this family and to meet their needs. Principle 16, students with disabilities are included and receive instruction in conventional school programs. And many of them are already in your general education classrooms and their disabilities may be invisible. You may not even realize that they are struggling with, with ADHD or learning dis disabilities. Um, because some of them have acquired some strategies and they are working a lot harder, you know, perhaps at home. Um, but they, but many of them, I would say the majority of children with disabilities can probably work, you know, be served right in your regular education classroom. And in this course, I hope to give you some, some practical sort of things that you can do to make that possible. All right, before we go on, I want to just, leave you with a few ideas and, and some of the things that these principles have made me think about. And that is, do we have a private school or do we have a Christian school? Because if we, if we will only accept students who are academically, intellectually elite, you know, that pass our entrance exams, maybe we're really just a private school. Um, a Christian school should model should follow the model that Christ set for us. And he is the master teacher. And he said, suffer the little children to come unto me. And then we also have all these verses about, you know, being a help to the poor and the needy. I think that is what sets us apart from the private schools. We're Christian and we should include all of them. Some of the examples that I think of from the Bible of the fact that God, many times he reaches out to the the ones that maybe, you know, would not be the best and the brightest and the most elite. And he uses them in his service. Think of Moses. Moses was, I think, a murderer. <laughs> now, I wouldn't recommend you take in murderers into your class. Um, but, but he was also, maybe, maybe he was a little inarticulate. That's possible. 
he at least believed that he was. That even if even if he even if he were or weren't, he believed he was. And um, but God used him in a powerful, powerful way. And I think of David also. David, the apple of, his, of God's eye, um, who became just such a great leader, a, a, a great king, and a warrior before that. Well, he didn't have a lot to recommend him early on. He was just a young shepherd boy, not educated. The only um, gift I think that he had was he could play the harp, a kind of talent, I'd say that he could play the harp, and he could uh, lead the sheep, and he, he could fight. But even then, you know, that was because God equipped him to do that. But in Samuel, remember when he went to, he was told to go to that particular house to, to anoint the king. And the father brings out all of, all of David's brothers because he assumed that, of course, it had to be one of those brothers. And Samuel did too. And Samuel went through all of them and God turned them all down. And they were all surprised when they said, well, there's... There is one more, but he's young and just a shepherd, but okay. And they brought him up. It, it really struck me that no one really thought about him as a contender at all for that position. And yet God did. And I think we can't discount those children who have disabilities, whether it's severe disabilities or you know, learning disabilities. We've even seen that in society and in our culture today that some of the, the people who are the most wildly successful um, in the industry have, you know, it turns out they've had learning disabilities or admit that they had dyslexia growing up. So even, you know, even in the secular world, we have to consider that. Another thing to leave you with is to remember that each person is designed by our creator um, for his personal glory. And I think of 1 Corinthians 12, 18 and 19, talks about the parts of the body and how each one has its own function. Um, and those, each one of those functions together, and each one is really, really important. I, I'm, even the little finger, I'm, I'm glad it's there. I think we need it. You know, the ear is small, but we need it. Our nose, you know, our big toe even is important because you don't have it, you lose your balance. Um, but there's all these little parts of our body that are so very necessary. And yet when you apply that to the body of Christ, there's some parts of the body that are being excluded from Christian education. And another example that comes from um, a different book I, um, that we use for philosophy of Christian education. And she uses Luke 14, 12 through 14. And Christ tells his disciples, so he's preparing the feast. And he says, go out and get, you know, he said, go and, and get the poor, the maimed, the blind, and you will be blessed. With this feast, you know, at, where he wants the poor, the blind, to come to this feast and to serve them. Well, instead of asking for them to go out and, and bring in the elite and, and those, because if he had invited all the elite and the powerful, then they would have accepted. You know, he, he would have had to reciprocate in some way. But when he invited the poor, the main, there was no way that they could reciprocate. Another way to look at that, too, is that in our Christian education, we put a really good job. Academically, we have really added on. We've added on our curriculums are top of the line. When you compare to what the public schools have, our curriculums are great that, that are available to us. The programs that we have, top notch. We are providing a feast academically, an academic feast to the children in our Christian schools. But have we invited the disabled? Are they being excluded from that feast? And I think in many cases they are. So we need to find ways to include them and invite them to. And remember again, you know, I want to close with what we began with, what our mission is. Our mission is to reach all students, every one of them.